very much, Michael, for the invitation. And I, this is going to be quite a change of, of topic. So I thought I would give a bit more of a background as to the type of research that we do in my lab that, do, that does essentially functional proteomics. And maybe to give you a little bit of a flavor as to uh, why computational biology and, uh, and bioinformatics is important for that kind of work. So just uh, before I get there, I want to bring everybody to the same page by a couple of very basic concept slides about proteomics and in particular interaction proteomics. So what we're trying to do in my lab and in many other labs actually in this department is to try to identify association between protein inside any cell, if you can plant cells, as you think there, uh, and, and, and to see essentially who works together with me. And to do that, most of the time, what we're going to do is try to purify a blue protein, that bait protein, together with its interacting partner, the orange and green uh, balls that I showed there. And you want to purify them away from the rest of the cells, uh, which is shown here in red. And for the purpose of my talk, we call them background <coughs> components. And so the basic idea is you're playing this game between trying to maintain the interaction between the blue and its interactors, and you're trying to get a sample clean enough that you'll be able to make a call as to whether you have been able to enrich the interactor. So the one thing that's also really important is in my lab we use mass spectrometry as a tool to identify all the proteins, both the contaminant and the likely true interactor. And to do proteomics uh, using mass spectrometry, we tend to not identify the entire protein, but rather peptides that we generate from these proteins. And we generate those peptides using enzymes, usually trypsin, that cleaves after uh, uh, precise uh, amino acids such as lysine and arginine. And those are the peptides that are entering the mass spectrometer where we're going to identify them. And I have a slide on that next. But at the end of the day, you should be able to have a list uh, associated with some quantitative information of your bait protein, right? You're hoping to recover what you're aiming to recover, alongside a certain and unknown number of its true interacting partner and then other contaminants in the cell. So this uh, middle part of the identification works in most cases uh, by what we call uh, MSMS or tandem mass spectrometry. And essentially what happens is we couple the, so, so we, we make the digestion usually in solution, so it's going to be a very complex mixture that's going to contain a thousand of protein that are all going to be digested with trypsin into small peptides. And these are loaded onto a capillary column that's uh, essentially uh, providing a liquid chromatography type of separation. And this liquid chromatography colon is placed immediately in line with the mass spectrometer so that as you deliver the gradient of uh, uh, hydrophobicity usually, uh, the, the peptides are eluted from the tip of this chromatography colon directly in the mass spectrometer. And as they do so, they get uh, properly charged so that they can be detected in the mass spectrometer. So essentially what the mass spectrometer does is take a bunch of snapshots at every time that there is uh, protein or peptides that are essentially co eluted it takes a snapshot of the peptide parent mass to charge. And this is what I show here on this, on this uh, uh, figure. And then the next thing it's going to do is it's going to determine the relative abundance of all of those peptides that it sees. And then it's going to systematically select a certain number of peptides to be isolated, fragmented, and remonitored. And this is why we call this a tendon mass spectrometry or an SMS. And this is the second step, this fragmentation pattern that we're going to use to actually sequence the protein, the, the peptides. And the way it works is essentially if you have a peptide here shown at the top left, when you uh, do this fragmentation, it's going to break the peptide along the peptide bond into uh, predicted ions that are either going to retain a charge at the end terminus or at the C terminus. And when you essentially look in the mass spectrometer, you're going to be able, I'm just showing here the N-terminal charge, you're going to see essentially all of those different peaks separated by the mass of the amino acid that gets essentially added or removed. And so how we do uh, to reconstitute the sequence, in most of the cases now, since 1994, when the first uh, computational tool to do so was developed, we're essentially comparing those acquired spectra and in my lab, we're acquiring uh, about 10 per second in the mass spectrometer. And so we're comparing those acquired spectrum to a theoretical spectrum that gets generated usually from translation of RNA uh, base or DNA base that exists. 
and everything gets a score, and then essentially, if the score passes a certain threshold or a certain probability value, we determine that we have identified this as the true peptide. Is that clear for everybody? And of course, once you have the peptide identified, you turn this back and ask for uh, those, with all the list of the peptides that you think you have seen in your uh, sample, which proteins do they map to? And that's how we do protein inference. All right, to bring all of that together, what that means in practical terms is we couple experimental pipeline. So in this case, we're going to be fusing an epitope tag on that blue protein so that we can essentially fish it out from inside the cells, right? So we're fusing this epitope tag. We're expressing the protein at low levels so that we don't induce uh, artifacts, try not to induce artifacts. And then we're going to try to do a rapid purification under gentle conditions. So we lyse the cells and we do a rapid purification so that we try to maintain those in interaction with the true interacting partners. And then we, again, uh, di uh, digest uh, the, the protein that we have into peptide and we identify them using those tools that I showed you. And you may realize that we're doing fast purification and quick washes. And what that means is our samples are going to be really dirty. And we're going to have many of those contaminant protein that we're trying to score. But I also told you that we can get quantitative information in the mass spectrometer. So what we do is we design negative control that are meant to essentially tell us uh, uh, what the normal background would be, what the normal contaminant would be. And then for each of our purification, what we're going to try to do is to score the quantitative information for each candidate prey interactor uh, against all of those other backgrounds. And we do that by developing a computational pipeline, which I'm just going to briefly uh, uh, describe here. But essentially, we develop our own names that extract the metadata and all of this uh, search uh, information that, that, they, that they told you. And essentially, it's going to be uh, recording safely all of our data. And we couple this to a significance analysis of interaction or SAMP tools that are going to be able to do the step that's very important to compare any of the acquired data for every for base purification to our negative control data and try to assess the significance of the interaction. And then on top of that, we need to develop tools to visualize and, and, and analyze these data. Now, I won't go into too much uh, detail. But essentially, the way that we do uh, the, the name system, it's all Protis. This is developed by two programmers in the lab. Uh, and it, this was done initially in collaboration with Mike Tires. But at, at the um, base of Protis, we have essentially at the top of Protis, we have all of the mass spectrometers, all of the data that gets generated from the mass spectrometer that needs to be converted to uh, uh, formats that uh, the search engine that are going to be telling us what the proteins are in our sample can read. And at the bottom, you have the user. And the user can define projects. And, and of course, you can give them access to different projects. And then under the projects, in our case, we have base. And those are the different proteins that we're trying to purify. Under each of them, you can have a number of different experiments, different conditions, different variation. And under each of them, you can have a number of samples that tend to be the replicate. You need to do a biological replicate. And then whenever a sample is created, there is a menu scheme that goes and tracks from the raw mass spectrometry acquisition a similar naming scheme so that things get automatically linked and you don't lose your files. And of course, all of that communicates to outside repositories so that you can transfer the data of for, to, uh, 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 for example, raw data can be transferred to Massive for publication, and you can also facilitate deposition in the interaction. Just to give you a little bit of an idea of one of, uh, of, one of our recent tools, this is not yet published, but this is online. It's called ProvidViz. And this is a set of visualization tools that do the other side. This is essentially like how do we look at the data. And of course, if you have a look at any interaction proteomics paper, you will see that most people are actually using network visualization tools such as Cytoscape. But there are many cases where this is not ideal to convey quantitative information and differences between uh, different purification. So what we did is we developed a, it's, it's online, uh, it's accessible online, you don't have to download it, anything. We've developed a toolbox that enables us to look at mostly either heat map or those uh, dot plots, which we like better, to essentially look at all of your data. So you're gonna have all of your bait purification on the, the, the horizontal and the vertical is all of, our, all of the prey protein. And this is an interactive website. So you can zoom onto any area of the map 
and essentially pull out all of this information. And you have uh, different metrics for the abundance, either relative for the same prey across all of your purification, or absolute based on the number of, of uh, times or, or intensity that you have detected for that particular protein. And then you, you're going to have your score or your uh, this false discovery rate in our case as an edge attribute so that you can see for which of those interactions you have confident data and which one you're not. And if you look at the bottom, we have a button that's uh, said, say, analysis. And this essentially will allow you to do from the selected list that you have there a number of different uh, processes, including gene ontology, protein domain, and network analysis. And so this is a tool that's been really useful uh, for all of our collaborators that are interested in biology. So just to step back now away from the tool development and a little bit more into the biological question, this combination of affinity purification to mass spectrometry is very powerful to identify uh, protein interaction for soluble protein complex, right? The for this to work, you have to be able to lyse a cell and then this, the complex has to be stable enough that you can capture your bait of interest and its interactors, and it has to withstand purification. Now, however, there are many, many cases where that doesn't work. And uh, the, as I told you, like the first thing that you're going to be doing is lysing the cells and trying to recover your complex. But what I did not tell you is between those steps, you're spinning down uh, the insoluble components of the cell. Right? So if you lyse your cells uh, under very gentle uh, condition, and then what doesn't get solubilized tend to be things like the plasma membrane, any kind of endomembrane, including the ER, the lysosome, and so on, mitochondria, uh, 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 structures such as the cytoskeleton, centrosome, and so on. And so what happens is you spin them down at the bottom of your tube, and now you cannot get any information about any of those proteins that are there because you just treat them out. In addition, when you do the cell lysis, you disrupt the, the uh, intracellular organization of all of the proteins inside. So this is a big problem. And so this is a big problem between those two things, especially in context of human biology. And just to give you a couple of snippets, uh, uh, the Vida Lab uh, assembled a collection of Mendelian disease genes. There is about 3,000 genes for which they have been able to clone a point mutant that is causative of one of the many Mendelian diseases. And about 40% of those encode protein that by our criteria would be insoluble and therefore at the bottom of the and this is true as well for uh, uh, proteins that are considered by the NIH as viable drug target that have been being studied enough because they include things as G protein coupled receptor, ion channel, uh, a nuclear receptor, and many receptor tyrosine kinase that we also tend to spin down at the bottom of our tube. So we need new uh, biology and new technology for that. And so fortunately for us, several years ago, there was a really revolutionary paper published by Brian Burke and Carl Roux that define a completely different concept to look at interaction proteomics. And this is called, and this is now well known, especially in Toronto for some reason, and this is uh, known as BioID or proximity biosimulation. In this case, the protein of interest, that blue protein, is going to be fused not to an epitope tag that's going to be used for fishing the protein outside uh, from, from the cell lysate, but it's fused to an enzyme, in this case a biotin ligase. The protein is expressed at near endogenous level inside the cell, where hopefully it interacts with its normal uh, endogenous partners. And then what you do is you add biotin from the outside of the cell. The biotin gets converted by this biotin ligase to a reactive intermediate that then diffuses away from the enzyme and is able to covalently label proteins that are in the vicinity of the bait, right? So what you end up doing, you do this labeling for a long period of time, in this case at least three hours, and so what you end up doing is building biotin, covalently uh, modifying the protein that has been in the context of the living cell in close proximity of your brain. Now this is a covalent labeling. You do not need to maintain protein-protein interaction anymore. So you can lyse the cells into very, very harsh conditions. You can denature the protein, and all you need to do is to recover those biotinylated protein on streptavidin agarose. And again, I told you that we identify peptides. So what we do for the evolution is we simply clip the non-biotinylated peptide using, again, the same enzyme trypsin, and we identify those in the mass spectrometer. And now you can imagine that if I had problem with background and contaminants initially, 
you're expressing an active biotin ligase enzyme inside the cell, so this is quite uh, problematic. So you need to devise proper control again, and we have several types of those controls and several types of designs. But then again, all of the tools that we spend a long time to develop can be used to tell from the list of those predicted interacting uh, protein, which one of them uh, uh, do we have enough quantitative data to call interactor? Is that clear to everyone? Good. So what do we do with that? I just uh, brought two little vignettes uh, today. And so one of them is we think that we can get a uh, definition, uh, ultra, <laughs> ultra resolution of, of the structure of some organelles. And I'll give you one example that, contain, that consists of the characterization of the P-body and the stress gradient. So it doesn't really matter what these things are, but those two organelles are involved in RNA biology. So just to bring everybody to the same page, uh, RNA gets transcribed into the nucleus where it gets spliced, it gets uh, uh, capped, it gets polyadulated, and then it gets exported to the cytosol where if everything goes well, it gets translated into protein in the ribosomes. If the RNA, however, is defective, and you want to degrade it, you can shuffle it into that green structure called a P-body that's essentially a bag of enzyme that's going to go via the emulate, the cap, and degrade the RNA. If the cell is experiencing a stress, what you're going to do it start instead is you're going to pause translation, and you're going to shuffle all of this RNA and its RNA-associated protein into that red structure called a stress granule, uh, where uh, it's essentially a parking lot. If you can resolve the stress, then the RNA can go back into translation. And if you cannot resolve it, then you're going to essentially see a fusion of the stress renal and the PKD. The problem with the characterization of the composition of those structures, and especially the structure of the role organization of those structures, they do not contain a membrane. They're very heterogeneous in size. So you cannot really fractionate them biochemically unless you play a lot of artificial tricks to that. However, they separate very nicely if you put different uh, fluorescent markers on a component, for example, of a Peabody or a stress renal, as you see on the left, again, with the same green-red color. So what we reason, and this is the work of a postdoc in my lab, Jiyong Yun, with uh, two technicians. And so what we reason is that if we put the beret tag on Peabody components and stress renal components, and also protein that are involved in translation, we might be able to get at the composition of those structures. Did it work? Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, I probably would have picked a different topic. Uh, but essentially, what you see here, this is just a, a, a partial view of the heat map. Again, on each of those uh, uh, images, darker meets more. So the two uh, uh, markers at the bottom, so those are the bait on the uh, horizontal. And, and then on the vertical axis is the prey. And so the two baits at the bottom, those are my Peabody baits. And you can see that they have a profile in the prey uh, uh, area, which is different from the other ones that are stress granule and protein shuttling between stress granule and translation. And so to identify new P-body component was really easy because we looked at the profile of known P-body protein, and we looked for protein that had essentially the same type of profile. And then what we did is we cloned all of them and we put them into a fluorescent marker and then we validated them by microscopy in strain that expressed reporters of either the stress granule or the PBD. And that worked really well for us for both the PBD, which I show here, but also for the stress granule, which was a bit surprising because our screen was not done in the presence of stress. But again, we can see uh, uh, that we were able to validate nicely that this uh, new guy here uh, has actually located to the stress granule in the presence of stress. So we did that many, many times. So that we have validated many of the P-body components, many stress renal components. But then we were a little bit surprised that we have some protein, which I showed by the, the purple circle, that form different type of structures uh, under non-stress condition that were neither overlapping with P-body nor with stress renal. So what we thought is, well, we have BioID, we can figure out what these structures are. Why don't we also do anyway all of the uh, praise that we have identified as BioID base as well, and try to see if this will give us more information about the organization. And then, uh, since Jiang was very ambitious anyway, she decided to also go back uh, to the path of synthesis, transport, and translation of the mRNA just to make sure that we've got really specific signal in the data. And, and uh, what I'm not going to really talk about is, is we have a student essentially now doing the same thing for the nuclear RNA body. But at the end of the day, uh, these guys did a lot of work. 
they generated a lot of data, and then they tried to see what it would like on the cytoscape map, <laughs> and it looked like this, which uh, I hope you agree with me that this is useless. <laughs> and so that's when we started uh, wondering if we could come up with other, really, other things than bait-prey relationship to essentially look at our data in a more efficient manner. And so what we decided to do is to essentially think of a bit about what it is that we're doing when we do uh, a bioid experiment. And so if you imagine that you have a cell uh, where at steady state you will have endogenous untagged proteins that will have to each other a certain distance relationship. So what we're doing when we're doing this bioid experiment, uh, for example with the first state, is we're essentially trying to make an assessment of the distance of each of those endogenous prey protein to our first bait. We can show the, the relationship here. But we, in our case, we do that not once, but not twice, three times, but we do that over and over again. And I think you can appreciate, especially in this crowd, <laughs> that what you're going to have at the end of the day is essentially a relationship map between the preys themselves, right? So we call that pre prey relationship, and then we use standard tools, including in the next uh, image, uh, a Pearson correlation, to essentially try to organize the data and see if we have any structure and any information out there. Why is that better? Well, first it is better from a biological point of view, because I told you that now we're making call about the endogenous untagged prey protein, and it turns out that it, this is actually quite a bit more resistant to artifacts that would be created by even mild overexpression or tagging of your bait protein. So even if my bait protein in my data set or one of my bait protein is a little bit off into its, in its behavior, it should not affect this, this uh, uh, prey prey correlation too much, right? I, I appreciate that. So essentially we think that this gives us more robustness in our data and enables us to make a call regarding the localization and the behavior of the endogenous untagged prey protein. So we don't have to tag these guys to know where they are <coughs> and who's close to them. All right, does it work? Yes. Uh, this is actually from a, a little while ago, but I think it shows um, nicely that first we have structure. This is a Pearson uh, uh, correlation map of our data uh, uh, where we see 800 uh, prey by 800. So on the diagonal, it's just like the normal like, uh, self interaction, which you expect it to be being high, but you see that we have many different clusters. Those big clusters tend to map to structures, such as the splicing speckle and paraspeckle at the bottom. We have our stress venal and body cluster, and so on and so forth. Those smaller clusters, and I'm gonna zoom on a couple of them, tend to be protein complexes. And this is true even though we have not profiled, for example, any of the RNA exosome components as a bait, we can still recognize the organization of these as a, as a complex within our data set. And I told you that those bigger <coughs> structures are actually organelles, but we have in the case uh, of the people that stress granule probe this organelle with many different baits. And then what this tells us is we can get now some organelle resolution. In the case of the Peabody, this splits into three different clusters, one that functionally maps to the capping process, one that maps to the adenylation, and one that maps to microRNA silencing. Well, yes, how many Michael. bits did you have? In this particular map, only 56. That's only just a subset. Yeah, that's just a subset of what we did. <laughs> All right. And uh, just one little point is we used to like this correlation map, but those two deviations in the equation were a little bit difficult uh, for, for appreciating the off-diagonal relationship in particular. So, and, and those are important. You see that there is a lot of symbol on the off-diagonal. I think that's stuff moving. No, okay. Uh, so what could they mean? Well, it could mean that you have contact between organelles or complexes, and we're very interested in that. It could also be that you have a protein that moonlights and has function in many different areas. And one thing that, that we decided to do, actually after collaborating with Charlie from a long time, that kind of an obvious one, is we uh, simply put back this data, which is too far from the computer apparently, and we uh, put it back onto a cytoscape map. So this is exactly the same data that was this big blob earlier that would be completely useless. So here what I show is exactly the data from the cluster. We put a Pearson correlation cutoff 
of 0.7, and we essentially put everything back back onto that. So you see that we have maintained this nice structure, this nice resolution. We can see very nicely the contacts between some of the organelles, and we can actually make some prediction. For example, we have this area here in the Peabody where the argonaut and microRNA silencing machine is very located very closely to vesicles. And for anybody that does cancer biology and, and tries to figure out how those microRNA are packaged into exosomes, I think you can get actually quite a few good clues from this. All right, so the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, again very briefly, is how we expand that from the RNA biology that most of you probably don't care so much about, to getting a view uh, of, of the cell. And this is the work of Chris, a student in the lab. And Chris, when he started, we gave him this actual picture. And we told him, Chris, this is what a cell looks like. And cell biologists have been using green fluorescent uh, type protein for many, many years to mark specific organelle. So please do a literature review and clone all of these guys into stable cell line, do bioID on all of them, and you're gonna be able to get a map of the cell. And actually, that sounds crazy, but it's working. So that's what Chris has been doing. And first, he validates that he can actually uh, uh, use this marker in the same way that the cell biologists that were using the green fluorescent protein, so he validates his probes. And then he just makes sure, uh, in terms of quality control, that if he's selecting, and we're selecting many baits to probe each organelle or <laughs> structure, that the profile that he detects with each of them should be correlating. And in fact, this is the case. We can see that all of the baits that he has that are meant to, to uh, uh, map the nucleus, correlate really nicely to each other, they correlate in a bigger nucleus cluster, and this is the same thing, for example, for the membrane uh, containing uh, group. So we, we have this map, we have all of this data from the BioID, and again, the question is, now that you have that, what do you do with it? And so one thing that we thought really easy, that is really easy is that there is a, a still a lot of protein that have no clear known localization and function assigned in, in human cells. We thought that this could be useful. And then I'm going to talk about the two other things later. <coughs> so just to do that, conceptually, I told you that we're trying to map each organelle with multiple baits. Well, in theory, if you have a protein that gets picked up uh, as a high confidence interactor for several uh, of the components of, of the same organelle, most likely it is going to be associated with this organelle. Of course, you can normalize uh, by looking at the other organelles or structures that you've been looking at. And that's true and it works to some extent. But what turns out to be a little bit more powerful was to essentially do the same thing as I told you for the RNA granule uh, project and to essentially convert this prey-prey relationship uh, information uh, to, again, like a, a uh, Pier again, Pearson correlation, again, the same uh, cutoff. Uh, so that we have now a, a visualization of all of the relationship between the praise in our data set. And what I uh, colored on there uh, is essentially the known go annotation. You can see that the clusters, the colors tend to cluster with one another, which is, which is good because then that means that we can use tools that were developed to do essentially assignment of function or location based on network topology. And this was developed uh, by Anastasia. Uh, uh, Varashnikova, who was a student here in, in molecular genetics, so this was quite nice. So our tool is named SAFE and has been working really nicely for us. On this map, which is several months old, we think that we have assigned about a quarter of the express proteome to, to, to a physical location. This is a bit higher now, we think we're above a third, uh, but we keep working on that. So how we're using this, this map is essentially uh, to look at the uh, location of proteins that are not visible necessarily known or well studied. And we were working on the phosphatase data sets for which we had a lot of information. And of course, most of the phosphatases have uh, on the map the location that you expect them to have based on, on our own data in the literature, so that's not good. But we found some surprises, and one of them was this protein called PPRH, or SAP1, which was predicted to be located at the plasma membrane alongside all of its family members. But clearly on our map was located in a different area, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, is the endosome. So luckily we have done in this a reciprocal bioID, and uh, we found that it and its parallel uh, RJ, alone of all receptor-terrifying phosphatase, are able to interact not with plasma membrane protein, 
put within those own components. So really there is a power of, of, of prediction in our pre-relationship -pre to identify our new localization for, or to re redefine um, localization. So just to give you a little bit of a bird's eye view of the map, so this is what, what it looks like. Again, this is a bit of an old version, but you can appreciate really nicely that this tells you a lot about cell biology, and especially the contact and organization uh, between organelles. For example, you see the mitochondria on the left side, the mitochondrial outer membrane, and the ER membrane come very close. This is really important for biology because those two organelles have a lot of interaction, which are uh, uh, key for, for the response to many different stimuli. You also see that the plasma mem membrane breaks into different groups. Uh, different um, uh, region of the plasma membrane, but also there is a lot of interaction between the plasma membrane and protein in the trafficking pathway in the endosome. And it turns out that most of the protein at the interface have been uh, involved in, in recycling endosome uh, pathways. So this is quite good and we, we are looking at, at, at this in, in more detail. Uh, if you're interested in specific classes of molecules, for example, you're interested in lipid binding molecules, so that the OSBP, oxysterol binding protein, you can use that to discover new biology. And in fact, almost all of them are located to, diff located to different uh, membrane compartments, which was not appreciated in the literature. The same is true for plexstrain homology uh, domain containing protein. Same thing is true for solid carriers that are important uh, uh, multi-pass transmembrane protein that, are, that, that work usually as channels and whose function is not very well characterized, but which are really important for microbiology. All right, so beside doing the discovery, and of course we're doing more and more of this, uh, we think that, that, that this uh, uh, resource uh, enable, puts us in a really good place to essentially help the community to use BioID to, uh, or our resource to score their BioID experiment. And this is again the work of James, who's uh, calling himself now, I think, the king of my lab. Uh, so but James has, has created this, this, this website, which is not quite uh, online yet, we're still beta testing, but which holds all of the data, all of the quantitative information. It also has different ways that it predicts the localization of every unknown based on that uh, uh, tool that I talked about and also other prediction uh, uh, strategy that, that he, uh, he implemented. But essentially, you can retrieve from there all kind of data visualization tool and ex explore our own data. But uh, this is not usually what people want to do. They want to upload their own data and use our resource to score their data. And so we've implemented that again by a simple uh, X-based method where you can upload one bit at a time, essentially look at the enrichment and, and, and similarity profile with our own uh, base the data set download all of this information, but also you can project one or many bases onto a map directly. This is not super precise, this is just to give you an idea of how things are, but these are two of the bases that we're looking at right now, and they locate really closely to the ER membrane cluster based on the data that these users have generated, which we have uploaded to our website. So we think that this is going to be quite useful, not only to look at the localization of normal wildlife protein, but again, to think back about this kind of disease-specific uh, interaction and, and localization. And together with, with uh, Mika Depale here, uh, Sandra and Jeff in my lab, have been looking at mutation in that protein LUT1, which is uh, one of those multi-pass uh, tra uh, transporters. Uh, and there is a mutation that was uncharacterized, which is uh, uh, linked to epilepsy. And uh, when they compare that to our map, uh, they found that, in fact, this mutation uh, can cause a much uh, a closer uh, association of that protein to the endosome as opposed to the plasma membrane. So this is a protein that should be cycling between the trafficking and the plasma membrane. And, and the mutants spend too, too much time essentially in the endosomes. Of course, we can validate that by high resolution microscopy. So what we did is this, this approach of using a cell map as a essentially screening tools for, for disease-associated mutation can be actually quite good. So the last thing I want to just briefly talk about is, is uh, that we can use the information in this map to develop what we call compartment sensitivity. So if you have a BioID bait probe that gives you a very nice profile that, for example, will tell you about the actin cytoskeleton or the surface of the mitochondria, uh, you could use that simply as a proxy to uh, investigate 
without having to do purification of this organelle or this structure, it, the changes in its composition following whatever treatment. And I'll just give you one example to make the work of an example like Jeff in my lab, who essentially was interested in developing approach to map the surface of the lysosome. So I won't go into detail, but he generated and validated his probes. And he's able now to use this probe to systematically define what were the changes in the composition of the lysosomal surface following a, a, a starvation in amino acid, which, which the, the lysosome essentially is important to the, for the response in, in, of amino acid deprivation by essentially changing the balance of, of, uh, of the uh, degradation and, and synthesis of, of our proteins. So what he did is he essentially profiled his, his uh, uh, sensor plus or minus uh, amino acid deprivation. And what he found is that as expected in the biology, this protein TSC1, which is an important effector of this pathway, it signals to a protein called TOR, which controls then translation, initiation, and response to amino acid deprivation. This was uh, recruited, that was a positive control, and that's good. But what he found was this other protein called GCM1, which is surprisingly the other amino acid signaling pathway inside the cell that talks to translation to a diff completely different machinery also gets recruited there at the same time during amino acid deprivation and then this turns out to, to also be biologically relevant. So by simply profiling the surface of the lysosome without having to purify anything, by looking at it in vivo, he was able to make those, those um, discoveries. So I hope that what I told you is a little bit of a snippet into how we use quantitative proteomic and bio-ID to uh, infer cell biological uh, 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 communication uh, between, between organelles, and that how, by com combining that to some uh, bioinformatics and computational tool, we actually get a lot of information. So we keep we're, we're doing that again, of course. What we've done right now is that last part with the sensor, we, we actually think that this is great to do all of our work in this model system, which is HK293. Uh, but really, where we want to go is, is in uh, either patient derived sample, for example, fibroblasts derived from patients with mitochondrial disease uh, should be profiled with our mitochondrial, our ER sensor, so that we can essentially see what's wrong at the molecular level. And we can also use our sensor to uh, see uh, during, for example, somatic cell reprogramming or differentiation globally what changes in, in uh, the cell biological organization of the cell. So I'm going to stop here. And this is work that has been done by a super great team of people in my lab. I'm so fortunate to have them. I've listed them here. Uh, I presented the work of some of them just as a little highlight, but they're all doing amazing work. Um, the work on, on the informatics for that project um, has been done mostly by James, actually, but with uh, continuous help from Yongwon Choi. Koi has been very instrumental in some of the scoring that they did not dare talk about, and uh, Alexei and Mike as well. The cell map project uh, is mostly, again, run by lab. It's a great collaboration with Stéphane Angers, Nico Tepal, uh, Tepale, uh, Laurence, and, and Brian. Um, and so that's, that's a fun team to work with. And we have a lot of input from cell biologists that tell us that we're wrong uh, and tell us how to do it better. So thank you very much for the attention. We have time for one or two questions. That was really stunning. Uh, on the RNA part, what, what sort of novel things did you learn from RNA? So many things. It's, it's actually what will we put in the first paper, I guess is the question. So so we, we have many, many new components. We think we figured out really how stress granules are nucleated or key nucleation factor for stress granule formation, which surprisingly were not known. And so and that we know not from what I presented today, but of course from follow-up uh, CRISPR screening that we've done, looking at the most connected uh, uh, proteins in, in, in our network, we thought like, they must have some kind of activity. So, so it turns out that this is true. We also think that this, this little bit that I showed you where um, we have connection between the Peabody, especially the microRNA sinusing machinery, and our uh, vesicles, we think this is how RNA gets into those exosomes. And if that's true, 
uh, that's actually a very, very big deal as you may imagine for cancer biology. And those are just two of the things that we've learned so far. It, we, we think the data is super rich and fascinating. Um, it's very exciting. Um, I was wondering for your Prey Prey network. Yeah. So it's a huge network, and I guess if you traverse it in different ways, I'm curious if you've tried to compare basically the most interconnected proteins in your network against known biochemical pathways. So let's yep. say if you run a minimal spanning tree, do <coughs> all the proteins that are presumably part of a known pathway match in the, in the proper um, cell locations that they're supposed to be in? Or do you find surprises? Actually, we haven't done that with pathways, but we've done that with a number of, so we've compared different level of pruning and different ways to essentially cluster and, and, and look at the correlation, right? This is, we, we didn't think that Pearson was gonna work so well, so we've tried different ways. Right now it's still winning, uh, but, but yeah, we haven't looked at pathways, but that's a great idea because they should be clustering together. Uh, what we find is that actually, there are actually quite a few proteins that seem to be moonlighting though. So if things did not cluster, uh, I wouldn't be surprised that this is due to uh, partially a moonlighting activity. So part of the way that we're doing the scoring the sequence uh, input was to essentially try to also look at, at uh, different ways to score the data. It's uh, got us to use non-negative metric factorization to okay. look at the possibility of having multiple localization. And, and so what we're doing right now is we're uh, systematically analyzing Things that would be predicted to more than one localization, and try to see whether that we can, whether we can provide additional evidence for, for that to actually be true. Don't know if that answers. Yeah, that does. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very much.